Today is a mark for us as World Communion Sunday, and when I was younger, I used to think that the whole world was taking communion together today. Christians in Africa and Christians in uh, Cuba and El Salvador. And as I uh, got older and began to travel to some of those places, I realized they don't. They, the whole world is not taking communion today. And then it occurred to me when we take communion on World Communion Sunday, it is a day to pray for the world God has created. So what a powerful day this day is to come to the table, to remember this world that in many places is broken, but in many places is wonderful, to give thanks and to offer our prayers to God. Let us pray. We have heard so many voices this week, O oh Lord, cluttered in our mind, business voices, political voices, health care voices, voices of our friends and families, our own internal voice that goes with us all the time, everywhere. And so now silence all of these voices within us that we might hear your voice. Speak clearly to us the truth that sets us free. A voice that heals the world and all its wounds. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'm always glad to have folks join us uh, online. We have several people listening to our sermons uh, around and about, and that's a good ministry from First Presbyterian Church in Richmond. So we welcome all those folks. In October, um, I'm going to preach, um, I'm not so much calling it a series, but I am preaching on four people during the month of October who had four totally different responses to Jesus when they met him. And in those responses and in those conversations and in those encounters, it would be my prayer that we would find ourselves, perhaps in all four. The poor widow, the young rich ruler, the woman with an alabaster jar, and Joseph of Arimathea. Today we begin with the story of a poor widow. In Mark's Gospel, we read, as he taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes. <laughs> I hate this text, by the way. And to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogue and places of honor at banquets, they devour widows' houses. And for the sake of appearance, they say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Hmm. And then he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. And then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The word of the Lord. Well, don't worry, I'm not going to beat you up with this text, but I... Um, I find it interesting that Jesus actually sat down and watched people give their offerings. 
I mean, he intentionally sat down and just watched people give. Can you imagine Jesus sitting next to you when you fill out your pledge card? It's a nervous laugh you have, by the way. I mean, it would be so strange to sit at my kitchen table or at my office desk and, and begin to make my gift to the ministry of this church and to give my offering to the Lord and have Jesus sitting next to me watching me put this number down. I'd want to turn to him and say, is, is, this, um, yeah, is this okay? We, we going to be good? Yeah. I wonder how he would look at my gift. It'd be a daunting thing to fill out my pledge card and Jesus watching me. But that's what's happening here. And money is a very private matter, isn't it? It's easier to talk about sex, which our society seems obsessed with, by the way, or to talk about politics, even though I have noticed at all the parties I've been to lately, nobody talks about politics. <laughs> It's like we don't want to kill each other, so we just avoid it. Or it's easier to talk about religion. But money? No. None of us discloses how much we make. Unless you're a public figure like I am or the mayor, where you have your salary published before people because you work for the public. And what we give is a private matter, unless it's not. Because some gifts are published. Like when you go to the symphony, I always go to the back to see who's in what category. And it's just interesting to see the top tier, the middle tier, the bottom tier. And I've often wondered, I wonder what it would be like if we did that at church. Yet another nervous laugh. The story of this poor widow, see, is not private. It's very, very public. She's giving in public. There's nothing secret about it. It's an act of her commitment and her love for God, and it's not meant to be private. See, this story happens outside the temple. If this were the temple complex or the temple building, then around us would be a very, very large courtyard that surrounds us on all sides. And many things happened in that temple courtyard. People came and went. They didn't actually go into the temple many times, but that's where the, the money changing temple, uh, the money changers were at the gate there at the head of the courtyard. And so when Jesus came in and turned the tables over, that was out in the courtyard. Many things in life happened in the courtyard, but one thing that happened was there were 13 offering containers for different offerings out there in the courtyard and people would come up to one of the containers, announce to the priests the amount of their offering and put it in the shofar, the trumpets shaped offering container. There's a verse in the Bible that says, when you give your offerings, do not give them by sounding the trumpet. I used to think that was like dun da da dun And then later I read that it might be those shofars were built in such a way that if you took a little teeny offering and threw it very hard, it would sound a trumpet. Don't go showing off, the Bible says, when you're doing good things. And yet there they are in the courtyard and this poor widow comes up, no status in society at all, and has to turn to the priest and says, to Lepta. If you're in the courtyard, you're like, oh, I wish I wouldn't have heard that. That'd be like somebody coming in here and the offering plate goes around and when they get ready to put their offering in, they say, two pennies. Now, if a child says that, they can get away with it. But an adult, that's all she had. It's embarrassing. It's the kind of thing you wish you wouldn't have seen. 
But I think Jesus was glad he saw it. That's why he's sitting there watching people give. He's, he's looking for something. I, I don't know what he's exactly looking for, but I think he found it in her. He contrasts her with the rich who he's been watching come and announcing large offerings and put it in. And Jesus must have thought, well, that's a large offering, but compared to what you're worth, it's not much of a sacrifice, Bob. But when she comes and says, to Lepta, I think Jesus stood up. I think he couldn't believe what he was seeing. As if, do the rest of you see, see this? She's put in more than all of them combined. How can this be, Jesus? The only answer can be he had a different standard of measurement. Hmm. I've met this widow, actually. I've met her several times in my ministry, but the one that sticks out the most is in my very first church, and I must have been 25 years old. And her name was Lila Pennington. She was a widow, and she had a mentally challenged adult son living with her in her very modest mobile home in Currituck County. She drove up old faded Ford Pinto. Remember those? With rust on the roof, it was so worn out. And Lila did alterations for people in our community, so you know she didn't make much money hemming clothes. And then the denomination, uh, the Methodist Church I was serving at the time, came along and did a capital campaign to raise money across the conference from churches to fund the minister's pension fund. And this happened before I became their pastor. And when I got there, uh, my treasurer said to me, I, I think you might want to go out and talk to Lila. Why, why, why is that? She not paid her pledge? No, she pledged way too much for this campaign for a pension fund, given who she is. So I thought about that for a while and prayed about it, and then I made an appointment. I went out to Lila's mobile home, and she's so gracious, and I had hopes that she would reduce her pledge. Now let me say this, don't get any ideas. <laughs> I will never come to your house and ask you to reduce your pledge. But the question that we all had in that little church was, how could Lila possibly give of her meager means so that ministers and Christian educators and missionaries could have a better retirement when we all knew that Lila had no retirement? Well, she's to be commended, of course, for her commitment, but she actually needed more help than anyone. And it dawned on me, why wasn't there an endowment at our church to help her with her son's medical bills? That would have been good. So that we could help her pay for those medical bills that were strapping her. Or why didn't we have microfinancing at our church, which are no interest loans, so that a, a person like Lila could come and borrow the money without any interest to advance her small business? Why didn't the church do that? But when I've talked to Lila, I remember this like it was yesterday. She very humbly said, Steve, you're so kind to think of me. But I'm glad to be able to do what little bit I can for those who give their lives in service to Christ. Huh. And I came back to the office with my long rope. Talk about being humbled in someone's presence. What is it that makes a person want to give like that, I thought. 
Is it, is it love for ministers or is it love for God? I knew it wasn't for recognition and it certainly wasn't obligation and it wasn't duty and it sure wasn't for a tax break. What drives this kind of generosity? I thought of my own story. I was raised in the church as many of you are. My, were, and my, my parents, I, I learned as an adult later, much later, I learned that my parents gave a tenth of their income to the church. They were tithers. And my dad was a minister, so in essence he was giving a tenth of his salary back to his employer. Doesn't happen in most businesses. But that was his discipline and my mother's discipline. And as a child, they gave me a box of those offering envelopes. You remember those things, some of you? And each week you'd find the Sunday in there and pull it out and then put some nickels and dimes in it. But you, when you went to church, you went prepared to make an offering. That's what was behind all that. Well, in college, I had a faith awakening. Uh, that's another story for another time, but it changed my life. And I, I wanted to give, not nickels and dimes. I, I wanted to give. I wanted to be a part of what God was doing in the church and in the world. And I didn't want it for a tax break, and I wasn't giving to the poor, even though I think that's an admirable thing. It wasn't charity. I wanted to give to God, and what God did with that money was none of my business. If you want to give it to the poor, if you want to build a church, if you want to support a missionary, it's your money. And then Catherine and I were married my second year in divinity school at Duke, and and then she shared my desire to give, or I shared hers, because actually she was raised Southern Baptist. Do I need to say any more than that? <laughs> so here we were in Durham, living in Poplar Apartments on Irwin Road in, um, in our little apartment. And she had a, a job on campus in the political science department making um, hardly anything. And we were in graduate school and we were building up debt and we had to pay the rent and the groceries and the gas and the laundry and the insurance on the car and hopefully we had a little bit left for some entertainment. I mean, maybe we could go to the movies. And then we went to church and they gave us a pledge card. Now, let me just say, I was more inclined to take money out of the plate than I was to put money in it. I mean, when that plate came by, it looked awfully good to me. But I came home and I said, Kat, what are, what are we going to do? What, are, what can we give? Well, we'd heard about tithing, this 10% of your income. We had to figure out, is that net or gross? You know, all those kind of calculating things. We found a number and there it was. And I had to figure out, can we live on the rest of it? 90% can we pay the bills? And I think I still have that scratch pad somewhere. I put it in my memoirs and it's in a box somewhere where we chiseled out, how are we going to give to the Lord? And we decided to tithe. And, and the way we did it was kind of uh, spiritual and kind of practical. I mean, we said, you know, this is a guideline for us. And, and as our tide goes up, all the boats go up. So when we start making a lot of money, our tithe will increase according to what we're giving. So this proportionate giving made a lot of sense to me. And then if our salary goes down, our giving goes down, and you just kind of feel good about it. It's a guideline. But can we live on the 90%? And I remember saying, well, look, let's try this, and, and if we can't meet the bills, we'll just stop tithing. We'll just quit. And we'll go back and pay our bills because we can't go in debt anymore. And even talking to you about this makes me feel a little awkward because we don't talk about money in public. But when you think about it, giving God 10% of your worth or your income and you get to keep 90 and live on that is a pretty good deal. Considering God's giving you the next breath, you're getting ready to draw.
I wanted to stop nickel and diming God. But I had to pay my bills. The tithe seemed like a good way to do it. And then it dawned on me years later, shoot, the 90% belongs to God too. The whole thing is a gift to me. I belong to God. Me. But then I read the story of this. I've preached on this poor widow 70,000 times in 38 years. But one day I rolled her out and it dawned on me, you didn't calculate anything. I'm so calculated, 10% net income, not including any dividends from stock investments, you know, all that. And she comes up and says to the priest, to Lepta. And Jesus stood up. I'll guarantee you he did. She put everything in the bucket. What makes a person want to be so generous unless they're aware of the generosity of God? Ah, Paul writes, each of you must give as you've made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion. So that tithing thing cannot be a compulsion. It cannot be, you know, being pulled to it like that. No. For God loves a cheerful giver. See, this lady's pennies didn't make any difference to the budget of the temple. She didn't help them one bit. It took more time to count her pennies than they were worth to the system. And I don't think Jesus was interested in her pennies. I think he was interested in her. It was her heart that attracted him. It was her love for God that got his attention. It was her motive, not her money. There it is. It's always about the motive. It's never about the money. What is the motive of your giving? What drives your train? What would cause you to throw your whole life into a shofar? To Lepta. Oh, I think there's something he's wanted us all to see about this woman for all these years. He pointed her out. But you know what? He never told us her name. And in that sense, I think she could be anybody. She's everybody who out of love for God puts their whole life in the bucket. May her heart be a part of your heart and my heart. And may her commitment and her love for God inspire our commitment and our love for God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.